Do you dream of being a successful Lashpreneur? Do you know there's money to be made in running your own lash business, but you've quickly come to realize what you learned in your lash training just isn't enough to create a thriving business you can be proud of? You're craving more freedom in your life and you wish your lash business would give you the stability in your finances, flexibility and control over your time, and afford you the lifestyle you have desired since committing to going out on your own. I know you've got questions about how to run your business smarter and not harder, and you need answers now. I am your host, Tara Walsh, and I'm a licensed esthetician, master lash artist, and a business coach, consultant, and marketing strategist for lash artists just like you. I coach lash artists from all over the world on how to start, build, and grow a thriving lash business on their own terms. I share bite-sized knowledge nuggets for you to start taking your business and your life to the next level and offer valuable insights, strategies, and crucial mindset shifts to take you from overlooked to fully booked so you can live the life of your dreams. This is the Lessons of a Lashpreneur Show. Hey, Lashpreneurs, this is a podcast exclusive. What does that mean? That means normally I'm sitting in front of a computer recording video and audio, and this is going to be broadcast everywhere. This is an audio exclusive just for you podcast listeners. So you're welcome. Love you guys. Uh, why? Because I am so dang inspired. I have this amazing way of describing healing that I think is really powerful that's going to serve you. And I can't wait till I get home to record it because I'm stuck in traffic. So you guys are getting just an exclusive invite into the head of Tara as she's worked through what really is healing. So let's dive into it. This was inspired by a conversation I had with one of our mastermind clients. Now, as part of the mastermind, there are opportunities for me to work with members individually and really do some deep dive. Mainly it's around performance of the business owner. We get into mindset, we get into what is really blocking them from implementing what they strategically know to do in business. So in that program, we cover marketing heavily for building out teams, marketing for teams, which is just a little bit different than um, marketing for a solo business. We get into the management of team members, all the nuances of being a leader and managing a team and hiring and firing and all those fun things that come along with being a team leader and a employer. And then we also do mindset, which is my favorite part to coach on for anything, but especially when it comes to business performance, because you can know all the steps, you can know all the things that you should do, and yet you just don't do them, or you do the opposite of them, or you self-sabotage, or you're just not getting the results you want. That's all between the ears. And so this particular member has been the one that's kind of struggled in the program the most in showing up. And she was having some stuff go on in her business, uh, which somewhat was expected, when you start to get structure in a business and you have a team, oftentimes the team you, you, that you've built won't like you getting structure in place because likely they've been taking advantage of you and they've been living the good life and that's been causing a lot of stress and strain. And so when you start to kind of take back control of the business and start to get structure in place, those people that have been riding on your hurt tails don't tend to like it. So she had a lot of team members leave and that kind of sent her into an anxious downward spiral and so she was having a hard time showing up in the program getting support finally got uh connected with her to really offer her some really in-depth support to help her understand kind of what her experience was and what i was noticing as we really started to unpack some stuff and, and she was so courageous in sharing so openly about the things that were causing her anxiety and maybe some um, underlying uh, traumas that she had experienced in her past was she kept um, kind of rejecting her experiences and or maybe she was just trying to make sure that she wasn't showing too much or she was you know didn't want to I don't know come off as a burden to me or whatever uh, but she kept she would start to like toe the line of sharing what was really affecting her and what she was really thinking and she's like but I feel that but I feel that, but I've talked about that. I've been in therapy, right? Like I've been doing all the things. She was, she was very much in the doing phase of like, I feel that. And I got curious. I'm like, well, if you've healed it, then why is it still impacting your decisions? And it got me really curious to think about, and that's what this episode is really going to be an exploration of is, well, what is healing? Uh, because by her label of healing, it's, I've talked about it. I've healed it. It should be done. It doesn't affect me anymore. Yet, the experiences she having, she's having in her behavior would indicate she hadn't healed from it, right? Uh, so I'm not here to judge her healing process. And if she thinks she's healed from it, great. 
I, I don't define what she's been through as having healed it. And so that's where I think um, I kind of started to explore, well, what does healing truly mean? So I wanted to offer kind of a definition of how I look at healing to see if it resonates with you guys. So when it comes to traumas that we've had, and I, I label these as big T trauma and little T trauma, because we can be very, uh, we can reject our own experiences in life a lot especially when we compare ourselves to other people's experiences and maybe ours weren't as quote unquote significant um, or as horrific as we might label some other people's experiences. Therefore, we downplay our trauma. So there's big key trauma in my world, which are the things that are rightfully so traumatic, uh, illegal, very violating of your body, of your heart, whatever. Those big T traumas are kind of the obvious ones. Um, a lot of sexual trauma, a lot of childhood trauma, those kinds of things. What I label, and this has kind of been more my experience, is little t trauma in that it's still traumatizing to the nervous system. My body still experiences it as trauma. However, if I were to describe it to somebody else, they may not see that as traumatic, but it was traumatic to me. So, for example, um, you know, there's this, this example when I've uncovered my own kind of inner child work where my dad, I was, I was probably four or five years old. I was walking behind him in our, our family home in the garage. And I went to go give him a hug and a kiss like I had done hundreds of times before as a four or five year old. And I went to go give him a kiss on the lips. And he turned to me and said, daddies and daughters don't kiss on the lips. He probably has zero recollection of that happening. So that to me is the first time I ever remember experiencing rejection. Uh, and again, I had to uncover this by trying to explore some inner child work because I don't know why that memory stood out to me, but I do remember that. And as an adult and processing through my inner child work, I was able to recognize that was when I felt rejection for the first time and turned from feeling inherently worthy to performance-based, achievement-based. That's how I get dad's love and attention is by achievement and doing, not just by being me, who I am, without any having to do anything. Um, so... Again, I, I am brushing over that very quickly. That that was years of unpacking that to get to that level to understand like why I am more action and achievement based just by nature. Yeah, one one situation that stands out in my head. So I would consider that a little t trauma. There was no physical abuse in that. There was there was no abuse of any kind in that. There wasn't any sort of violation of me as a human being, but it was very significantly hurtful to me as a human and changed who I was in that moment. And I think that's, I want to be accepting of all types of trauma. Cause look, you could have experienced that as a child in that exact situation and not thought a thing about it and moved on with your life. But for to me, that was like massively shifted my identity and my, my self-worth in that moment. Now, as a child, I wasn't aware that's what happening, but as an adult reflecting back, I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, so I want to encompass healing of all kinds of trauma, big T and little T trauma. So be open and accepting that your trauma may not look like what you currently label trauma as. And also you can still go, you know what? That was really traumatic without it seeming dramatic. Anybody in your life that's going to say, stop it. You're just being dramatic. Not a healthy person in your life. Not somebody who's going to give you the validation that you need to actually heal. Find a safe space to be able to uncover and unpack some of these things that you may be dismissing or rejecting or like I've already healed that or it doesn't affect me because chances are if it's coming up in your head it's like huh I think that's something that's affecting me it's worth exploring so what is healing from trauma for me I want to bring in the conversation of how we kind of traditionally will understand healing like when we get a wound when we have a cut a physical cut let's just say uh, you cut your arm, okay? You have a slice across your arm. What are some of the symptoms that you would experience from that trauma to your body? Likely bleeding, right? Pain. Um, yeah, I think those are kind of like the two main ones, bleeding and pain. So you're having symptoms based on the trauma that happened to your arm. And so I think there's different layers of healing that we go through when we have a physical trauma. And so the first layer would be, what do we do when we have a bloody arm? We put a compress on it to try and stop the bleeding, right? We try to stop the first symptom and we put pressure on it, okay? So we're putting pressure on the wound to stop the bleeding, right? 
in that we still have pain and we have some lingering pain, but it's getting less and less over time. And the more pressure we put on it, maybe the less it hurts over time. So the first layer of healing is stopping the bleeding and stopping the primary symptoms of pain and whatever else is, is coming up. So when, if I take the compress off, we've stopped the bleeding, is that healed? I mean, no, it's not. I, at least by my definition, choose your own definition. But I still have a cut on my arm. It has not scabbed over and it is very sensitive to any sort of touch or movement or anything disrupting it because it could start the bleeding and the pain again. Now, I hope you're following along on how this can correlate to emotional healing and emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. There's a very heavy correlation. So make sure you're listening to this through the words of what happens when an emotional trauma um, happens or a physical trauma that leaves emotional damage and trauma. So again, putting pressure on it, that stops the bleeding. Maybe it stops the pain. We take the compress off. It's still a wound. It's still very fresh, very new, very easy to go right back into the full traumatic pain and bleeding that hap like first happened. So that I think would be the first layer of healing is that we stop the primary symptoms from happening. Now, in an emotional state, when it's an emo some sort of emotional trauma um, or trauma that's lingering, like once the physical part of it is over, there's still that really fresh, really sensitive, really easily triggered wound that has not even scabbed over, right? And so anything can disrupt us to put us back into the bleeding and the pain all over again. So I think that's the first layer of healing is like, okay, it happened. And like accepting that like we have a wound, okay, the bleeding is stopped, but like, oh, we're still kind of just really, really sensitive, really easily triggered. The next thing that happens, kind of that next stage of healing is that our body will start to develop a, a scab, right? So the scab is the body's ways of body's way of putting a hardened shell over the wound so that the wound can heal from the inside out. So I think this happens to us when we're emotionally healing from trauma is that we put up defenses and walls and protection and a hardened shell so that we aren't at risk of somebody touching the wound and getting it to bleed and getting it to hurt again. So we put up walls, we push people away, we get defensive, we, um, we try to control everything around us so that nobody is near the wound and ain't going to touch it or jostle it or try and take off the scab. Now, I would say, based on the conversation I had with the client, this is where she was at. She had a very hardened shell over her wound that she was labeling as it's healed. Nobody can touch it. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't hurt. It hasn't, uh, it hasn't been bleeding in years or decades where most people live, I think is in the scab phase. In fact, some people really like to pick at the scab just to feel alive so they can bleed a little bit and they can feel a little bit of pain, but they're not ripping off the whole scab. They're just tiptoeing. And so maybe they've done that a few times and there's been some scarring on part of the wound, but still we are very protective over the wound that we don't let it heal. Uh, we haven't healed it fully. We're just keeping our hardened shell over it. And then what I really truly, how I define healing, and when you've quote unquote healed, if, if you think that you know healing is an end destination and you actually can heal and be healed from, from a situation, which I think you can, at least based on my experience, is that final phase where the scab is no longer needed because the scar has formed underneath and the scab will start to itch and we kind of just, we address it, but we know we can peel it off because what is left? The scar, right? And what does the scar represent? Well, the scar represents that we are changed, that it is not the same, that it does not look like the skin next to it. It doesn't look like the skin before it, that we are forever marked by that that wound, that trauma. However, it does not and will not cause us pain. It will not open up and bleed again. And we have accepted that this is us now, that we are not the same body or skin or person that we were before the wound. However, we've accepted that we will now have a scar that moves with us and we're okay with that. And it doesn't bring us emotional pain once it's healed. Once it's healed, we've accepted it. Uh, we have 
yeah, more or less accepted it, that it doesn't emotionally dysregulate us thinking about it. And for a lot of people, it's really hard to imagine the traumas, especially those big T traumas that they've gone through to think that they would ever, ever be okay in accepting that that thing happened to them. And that's why I think most people are just living with that scab because they're too afraid to think, if I accept that, what does that mean about me? If I accept that this happened to me, does that mean that I'm powerless over it happening again? I mean, that's a whole other episode and trauma related therapies that should be addressed because that, the reality is, is that once you've healed, once you have truly healed from whatever traumas, big T's or little T's, you can accept that it happened and not have it affect you anymore. And that to me is true healing. And that to me is what, God, if I could give that in a bottle and sell it, I would. Um, but really, that's the work that I've done to try and still continue to do. I'm finding wounds all over the place. Uh, I must be, I don't know, sick in the head where I'm like, okay, we've healed one thing. What's the next thing I can heal? Because every time I heal something, it no longer controls me. It no longer controls the decisions I make. In fact, I feel a lot more peace and a lot more calm. And I really start to discover the true me because I'm making decisions from a place of being healed, a place of not being afraid of the past repeating itself. And I love on myself and I love who I am and who I'm becoming on this journey because of my scars. And I love on, like, think about it if you've ever had kids and I know body image issues are, whoo, they're tough. But if you've ever had kids and you had stretch marks, it's really hard to hate the stretch marks. Like you don't love them, right? A lot of people call them tiger stripes. Um, but you also love what they, what, what they represent, right? Like my C-section scar, I had a C-section with my daughter. I don't love the fact that like the muscle was cut and I got a little shelf, like I just forever will have a little shelf there. And I also love that I had a kid and I actually preferred her to come out that way than the other way. Cause the other one came out the other way. He was 10 pounds out the old fashioned way. I didn't walk the same and the hemorrhoids are a bitch. Um, so the C-section scar for me was way better because that was an easier recovery and I got to like, yeah, it was just a whole other different experience. And so I can hate the scars. I can hate the way that my body looks in the mirror when I am comparing it to the non-mom version of me before I had kids and the body I had before I had kids. But that would mean that I wouldn't have my kids and that's not a reality I want to live in. And so it's, again, that acceptance of, sure, do, would it be nice if maybe that hadn't happened to me? Um, especially when they're those big T traumas. Yeah. But the reality is, is that it did happen to you and you actually don't know the other version of you that would have, who that person would have become had you never experienced that trauma. And it's a really, really hard place to be in. Believe me, there are plenty of times that I wish that I wouldn't have gone through the pain that I would have gone, that I've gone through and like the heartache and the utter shit that I've been through. You know, there's a lot of times that I wish, I wish I wouldn't have gone through that. And when I actually think about what does that actually mean, right? Like if, if, do I truly wish for that, that I'd never gone through that? Well, chances are I wouldn't be who I am today. And chances are I wouldn't have the things in my life and the series of events that happened after that, that thing, good and bad, would, I would not be me. I wouldn't even know me. I wouldn't even have a chance of knowing at me, uh, knowing me. And for me, the way that I've, been intentional about building my life has been impacting others with the skills and tools I learned because of the trauma. And so the reason why I, I have to find a way to accept these traumas and the reason why I choose to accept these traumas as a part of my story and who's created me to be who I am is also identifying that there's a real beauty that comes when you have healed and even in the process of healing and the other people who can relate and be healed by your healing. So. All of that to say, <laughs> I really hope that this episode gave you some hope around healing. I highly, highly, highly recommend um, a specific for very uh, deep seated traumas that you work with a trauma informed therapist, look for a trauma certified coach. Um, I am happy to point you in some resources or that is an opportunity that maybe we can work together to really truly heal so that you don't have to have this, this wounding controlling the decisions of how you move forward in life. That's all I've got for you today, my friends. Have a good one. 
This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp.com is a convenient, affordable, private online counseling platform available online and via iOS and Android devices. BetterHelp matches people with a licensed, accredited mental health professional best suited to their individual needs in a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp currently has over 20,000 counselors and serves English-speaking patients in over 200 countries. All of the counselors are licensed, accredited professionals, and BetterHelp allows you to connect with them in a safe and private online or mobile environment. Anything you share with your counselor is confidential, and the best part is, is that it's highly affordable and doesn't require insurance. Communicate with your therapist as often as you want, either through phone, video, or live chat. Visit thelashpreneur.com slash betterhelp and get matched with a therapist you connect with and feel comfortable with right now. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental illness, anxiety, depression, or is just struggling emotionally, or you have concerns about their well-being and mental health, there are ways to get help. We've included some links in the show notes below for you to find support online and in person.